Down and Out in Paris and London by George Orwell Adapted by Peter G. Morgan with Samuel Barnett as George Orwell Welcome to the Rue de Coq d'Or, a very narrow Parisian street full of tall, leprous houses lurching towards one another as though frozen in the act of collapse. It's a fairly rackety place, full of shouts, fights, loud singing and the sour reek of refuse carts. Monsieur Blair? Yes, Eric Blair. Madame Fillet's, manager of the Three Sparrows. You looking for a room? I am, but for six months, if possible. We don't rent rooms to anyone under 21, I'm afraid. Uh, I'm, I'm 25, actually. Here's um, my passport. Mm. You fool me. All right. This way. Our deluxe rooms are 200 francs per month. We take payment in advance on the first of the... Oh, that woman! She thinks she owns this hotel. Would you excuse me for a moment? Cow! Say to you! As I said, payment is on the first of each month. I trust that is acceptable. That'll be fine, thank you. And I think we're in accord, Monsieur Eric. Oh, no! Not again! You're disgusting! The Rue de Coq d'Or was a place for those who had given up trying to be normal or decent. And just as money freed people from work, so poverty had freed these individuals from ordinary standards of behaviour. And that's why I want to write about poverty, to show you how it affects people's lives. I'll start by giving you some idea of what life is like in this filthy quarter. Confessions of a dishwasher. Ugh. I don't think so. Ah. A rough time. Ugh, no, that won't do. Mm. Ah. Down and Out in Paris and London. Hmm. Not bad. By George Orwell. That's me, formerly known as Eric Arthur Blair. Adapted for BBC Radio by P.G. Morgan. Who's he? Part One, Paris, March 1928. Ah, there we are. Now... Let's get back to that hotel in Paris, where everyone, including the French, speaks impeccable English. Oh. We have all sorts here, Monsieur Blair. Students, bricklayers, stonemasons, prostitutes. What's your profession? I'm a teacher and a writer. A poor young English writer in Paris. I've never heard of such a thing. Good evening. Ah, oh, Monsieur Reginald. <clears throat> Meet one of your fellow countrymen. Mr Blair's from London. I'm from Putney, damn you! Oh. Or is it Ponte del Garda? Yes, that's the jiggy. Ponte del Garda. Cheapest wine in the northern hemisphere. Oh, bless my soul. Monsieur Reginald drinks four litres a day and six on Saturdays. Perhaps you two will become friends. But first... Here is your room. It's a little small, madame. And what on earth is that stink? Did the maid forget to clean in here this morning? We do not have a maid, monsieur. It's too expensive. And so is this room. Look, there are plenty of other people out there who need a place to stay. Do you want this room or not? Yes, I suppose so. Ah, your neighbours, Monsieur Rougier and his wife. Are they unwell? If drink is a sickness, and they're very unwell. So I'm sleeping next to a pair of smelly alcoholics. This gets better and better. The Rougiers have not taken their clothes off in four years. <sighs> They'd be millionaires by now, if only they could stay sober. Millionaires? They sell pornographic postcards on the Boulevard Saint-Michel. There can't be much money in that. Oh, you'd be surprised. As are their customers when they unwrap their sealed packets and find castles of the Loire. <laughs> They're usually too embarrassed to ask for their money back. <sighs> well, when you've unpacked, you must join us in the bistro downstairs. Mm -hmm. You and Reginald can get drunk for less than a shilling. You are old enough to drink, aren't you? 
Madame Falaise was right. You could get drunk in the Hotel Bistro for a shilling a night, which I did every night for several weeks. I wish one could find a pub in London a quarter as cheery or as friendly. Oh, my God. My God. Um, look, can you just hold on a minute? I, I need to deal with something. One at a time, please. Madame, all my money is gone. I'm afraid it was that young Italian in room 13. A man with side whiskers is never to be trusted. How much did you lose, my dear? 200 francs. It was my rent money for the next month. Oh, dear. But, but I have money from my teaching job. So what are you complaining about? Now, which of you imbeciles is next? Me, I think. I did not dare tell Madame Falaise the truth. My teaching job, giving English lessons, brought in at best 36 francs a week. Add this to the 47 francs I had in my pocket and I was going to have to live on... six francs a day. <laughs> it's curious. Your first contact with poverty. It is the thing you have feared all your life, the, the thing you knew would happen sooner or later. And then, by a piece of bad luck, it's here. Everything is suddenly extremely precarious. Take this half litre of milk. It cost 80 centimes. I must make it last. If I can just keep these wretched bugs out of the oh, Damn. That's the end of that meal. There are a hundred such disasters every day. I've stopped sending clothes to the laundry. The tobacconist keeps asking why I've cut down on my smoking. I've also discovered the boredom, which is inseparable from poverty. I have nothing to do, and, being underfed, I'm interested in nothing but food. Everywhere you go in Paris, there is food insulting you in huge, wasteful piles. Baskets of... Hot loaves, great yellow blocks of butter, mountains of potatoes and strings of sausages. A man who lives on bread and margarine for a week is a man no longer. He is simply a belly with a few accessory organs. And yet, there's a feeling of relief, almost of pleasure, at being genuinely down and out. I have talked so often of going to the dogs, and, well, here are the dogs. I have reached them, and I can stand it. But still, I must make some adjustments. Next. Oi, you with a Charlie Chapman moustache. Come on. So, what treasures have we here? Two suits, a waistcoat, a wool jacket, a pair of black brogues, and a leather suitcase. Mm -hmm. And uh, how much do you think these objects are worth, monsieur? 300 francs. Mm. You realise this is a pawn shop and not a charity? 70 francs. 70? Take it or leave it. Next. Uh, look, uh, that's fine. Really, 70 francs it is. Good. Come in after lunch next time. We're, uh, we're all in a much better mood, then. I'll remember that. Thank you. Next. I tell Madame Falaise that I made 200 francs from the clothes. Poverty is already tangling me in a net of lies. And then... My English lessons cease abruptly. One pupil is too lazy to continue. The other vanishes, owing me 12 francs. It is now absolutely necessary that I find work and I know exactly whom to turn to for help. Boris is a Russian aristocrat whose parents were killed in the revolution. We first met in hospital while Boris was being treated for arthritis and I for pneumonia. Boris is a curious fellow. 
A former captain in the Second Siberian Rifles, he always talks about the war as the happiest time of his life. Like many Parisian waiters, his ambition is to set up his own restaurant. The last time I saw Boris, he was earning 100 francs a day in tips at the Hotel Scribe. It's a great relief to know that I have an influential friend to fall back on. Boris? 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 <sighs> Wake up. It's Eric. <laughs> oh. oh, my back. I think it's broken. My dear Boris, what's happened to you? Oh, Eric, you have come at a bad moment, my friend. Boris is not only ill, but starving to death. For the past two weeks, I have lived on two francs a day, sharing this pitiful attic floor with Jewish mechanic. And to make matters worse, my leg is playing up. <laughs> ah, the ups and downs of life. Uh, what about the job? The hotel scribe does not employ invalids. But I am sure there are <laughs> plenty of hotels that do. <sighs> Eric, hand me that shoe, will you? I'm going to smash a few of these damn bugs. Ah! Never mind the bugs. Where's all the money gone? Oh, very good question. You were making a hundred francs a day in tips. You haven't spent it all, have you? Well, I'm afraid so. Oh. I pawned all my possessions, apart from my medals and regimental photos. The mechanic pays me two francs a day in lieu of the debt he owes me, but that's it. Boris's chest is spotted with insect bites and he now walks with a stick. I go downstairs to buy a loaf of bread. Food acts on his system as rapidly as a cocktail. Mm. Mm. Oh! <laughs> what brings you here? Well, I was hoping you'd help me find a job. Ah, then you have come to the right place. <laughs> a friend of mine is opening a new Russian restaurant on the Rue de Commerce. I will be the maitre d' and you can work in the kitchen. Well, what's the pay? 500 francs a month. Plus food. That's wonderful. <laughs> you could even become a waiter. <laughs> After all, you are tall and you speak English. That's <laughs> very kind of you, Boris, mm -hmm. but you know I have to concentrate on my writing. <laughs> writing is bosh. Huh? There's only one way to make money in publishing, and that is to marry a publisher's daughter. And you think the restaurant world is any different? Well, waiting is a gamble. You may die poor, you may make your fortune in a year. So... What do you think? Well, I'm interested. But what shall we do for money before the restaurant opens? I have to pay my rent. Oh, we shall find something. In life, as in bug fighting, remember Marshal Fox Maxim. Attack! Attack! Yeah. Attack! <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, my friend. We shall not starve. Nothing is easier to get than money. Onwards! So we head to a small cafe off the elegant Rue de Rivoli, which doubles as an employment bureau for hotel workers. I see you're keen to make a good impression. Oh, of course. My best suit and yesterday's Le Monde for the soles of my shoes. And now, the final touch. A bottle of ink? What on earth is that for? Oh, Eric, when a man's socks are full of holes, he needs to be... I'm a little creative. I ink the skin where it shows through my socks, you see. And voila! Huh? They are just like new. So what do we do now? We sit and we wait. There is an etiquette to these things. Each time a restaurant owner comes in looking for staff. Ah, bonjour. <laughs> Hello. He talks with the barman. Look. The barman picks someone and off they go. We won't be here long. You mark my words. I'm glad to hear it. I'm starving. No, Eric, no, 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 no. not so fast. That coffee has to last two hours. It's the barman's commission. You said we wouldn't be here long. Well, it's true, but one never knows in this game. The only way to guarantee a job is to slip the barman 20 francs. And as we cannot afford that, we must wait. <laughs> Hello. 
And so we wait. Hey, Roland. And wait. My bear. And wait. Savonneur. At the end of our allotted two hours, we are still waiting. <sighs> no matter. Tomorrow we shall find something, my friend. Our luck is about to change. You're sure of that? We both have brains, do we not? Yes, but... A man with brains cannot starve. Brains will make money out of anything. <sighs> Boris has vast capacities for hope. As we walk home... He entertains me with stories of how we shall live as waiters together in Nice or Biarritz with smart rooms and enough money to set up mistresses. Boris's leg and back keep him in constant pain. His vast Russian appetite also gives him torments of hunger, although he never seems to grow any thinner. At last we get to my hotel. Boris is too tired to walk the three kilometres back to his room, so he sleeps the night on my floor with his coat rolled around his shoes as a pillow. We will resume our search in the morning. Day after day, Boris and I drift through Paris looking for work. One day we cross the Seine 11 times. At every restaurant and hotel, it's the same story. <coughs> Hold my stick. <coughs> yeah? Ah, good day, sir. We are inquiring about the possibility of employment in your fine establishment. Have you worked in a kitchen before? Oh, I am waiter by training, and my friend here is dishwasher of many years standing. Uh, we need two men in the cellars. You'll do. Come in. Oh, splendid. One moment, please. Hold on. You didn't say you had a limp. Sorry! Oh, a former captain in the Russian army at the mercy of such Philistines. Don't fret, Boris. There are plenty of other jobs. Look, look at this advertisement. Mm. Circus hands required. Job requirements, cleaning up litter and moving benches. Must also be willing to let lion jump through legs during circus performance. Mm. Auditions today at 5 p.m., but what are we waiting for? For once, we are on time. An hour early, in fact. And yet we find a queue of 50 men already waiting. There is some attraction in lions, apparently. Merd. And so it goes on, day after day of listless boredom. When we are not looking for work, Boris and I study the bugs crawling across my bedroom ceiling and the rats scuttling across the floor. Sometimes we play chess. We make a board from the side of a packing case. Our pieces are fashioned from buttons and Belgian coins. Like many Russians, Boris has a passion for the game. He believes that the rules of chess are the same as the rules of love and war. He also says that if you have a chessboard, you do not mind being hungry, which is certainly not true in my case. Meanwhile, my money is oozing away. 60 francs soon becomes 8 francs, 4 francs and then 1 franc. For several days, Boris and I live on dried bread. And then for two days, we have nothing to eat whatsoever. Uh, Eric, do you mind if we stop for a moment? Mm. I am feeling a bit woozy. Me too. Mm. My blood has been replaced with lukewarm water. Oh. <laughs> Why has my saliva turned all white? <laughs> it looks like cuckoo spit. Mm. <clears throat> mm. That's unusual. Uh, I hear fasting is quite pleasant. After the fourth day, some people can endure three weeks or more. Mm. Oh, perhaps your flatmate could help us out. <laughs> well, he's paying you back at two francs per day, isn't mm. he? Maybe he could pay you more. I was meaning to tell you about him. 
What's happened? Well, well, I was asleep last night. He stole that two days from oh. under my pillow. He's no intention of giving the money back or of ever paying me again. Can't you talk him round? I'm afraid not. My Jewish friend is already one week behind with his rent and plans to escape before the Patron catches up with him. This is terrible. Without that money, we have barely 25 centimes between us. Never fear, my friend. I think it's time for a vigorous move. We return famished to Boris's attic room. As we stare at the bug-infested ceiling, smoking the last of our cigarettes, Boris lays out his plan. Eric, I must get my positions out of this house as quickly as possible. Then we can pawn our overcoats and get some food. But how can you do that in daytime? The Patron and his wife are always on the lookout for people slipping out without paying. You're bound to get caught. Mm -hmm. Allow me to explain my strategy. I've heard enough of your strategies for a while, Boris. Thank you. <laughs> oh, how easily you despair, mon ami. Where is that English courage that I have read so much about, huh? This better be good. <laughs> so, here is the plan. One of us will hold the patron's attention for five seconds while the other slips past with the suitcase and the overcoats. How will we do that? <laughs> I know his weak spot. He loves to talk about Le Sport. But neither of us knows anything about Le Sport. <laughs> I have thoroughly digested a recent article in the Petit Parisien about bicycle races. I will engage him on that. So, if you are talking to the patron, I have to take the suitcase. It's a brilliant plan, don't you think? <laughs> yes, quite brilliant. I will cough loudly when we reach a favourable moment. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> ah, Monsieur Fontaine, nice to see you. Monsieur Fontaine, what do you think of young Ledoux's prospects in this year's tour? I wait, trembling at the foot of the stairs. I fear the Patron's wife will come out of her office at any moment. He won't push over any player who tries to get near him, huh? <laughs> but, but I hear that you... <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I hear... <laughs> There's my signal. I sneak rapidly past the office, suitcase and overcoats in hand, and out onto the Rue Pascal. Boris's big shoulders block the doorway of the office. His laugh is also so loud that it covers any noise I make. A few minutes later, Boris joins me round the corner beside a fromagerie. Brilliant work, comrade. Now, run! As if by a miracle, our luck is changing. As we pass through the Rue Broca, I see a five sous piece glittering on the cobbles, enough for us to buy potatoes for dinner. I also take our last remaining items to a pawn shop in the Marais. It's in a dark courtyard between a brothel and a shop selling religious relics. I am not hopeful. What would I get for two shabby overcoats in a cardboard suitcase? Ten francs at best, or even five? Fifty francs! <laughs> Fifty <laughs> francs! <laughs> That night, Boris and I bought bread and wine and a piece of meat, and we gorged like wolves. Mm. What did I tell you? <laughs> the fortunes of war. We start the day with nothing, and now look at that. As you always say, Boris, there is nothing easier to get than money. <laughs> <laughs> Makes a change from all that writing nonsense. Hmm? Mm. Writing is an honourable job. <laughs> Dishonorable ones pay a lot better. <laughs> you sound like my father. <laughs> oh, he disapproves of your choice of career. He wanted me to become a policeman or a soldier. I tried. In Burma, the whole business disgusted me. Oh. And all this doesn't disgust you? Not at all. <laughs> I'm rather enjoying myself. <laughs> well, <coughs> let us drink to that, then. 
and the end of our fasting days. <laughs> <laughs> Boris quickly drank away his share of the money. I, on the other hand, have eight francs and plenty of cigarettes. I'm also stuffed to the eyes with food and drink and ready to start writing again. Boris, however, has other ideas. Harry, tell me, do you have any political opinion? No. Nope. What do you object to earning money from communists? I'm a freelance writer. I'll go with whoever pays me. Good. You see, there is a secret society of Russians in Paris who might be able to help. <sighs> but I'm not Russian. Ah, that is exactly my point. You see, these chaps run a newspaper. They're looking for someone to write about English politics. I don't know anything about politics. <laughs> There's a Paris edition of the Daily Mail, isn't there? Copy it from that. But the Daily Mail is a conservative paper. They loathe the communists. So, say the opposite of what the Daily Mail says. Then you can be wrong. Look, I don't like this, Boris. If the police catch me working for a communist paper, I'll be deported. Hey, give me that, give me that back. The Rue de Coq d'Or was a place for those who have given up trying to be normal or decent. What kind of artistic drill is this? We mustn't throw this chance away, my friend. I see you have no problem working with your parents' killers, then. A job is a job, Eric. Even if it is for communist paper, this is too good to miss. That afternoon, we make our way to a shabby street near the Chamber of Deputies. The sewers smell terribly and there's an overpowering stench of rotten food. The newspaper offices are above a laundry at the top of a dark staircase. We enter a small shabby room with a huge picture of Lenin tacked to the wall. Our host is an unshaven Russian in shirt sleeves. You are very careless. Why have you come here without any washing? Washing? Everybody who comes here brings washing. Then it looks as if they are going to the laundry downstairs. Bring a good, large bundle next time. We don't want the police on our tracks. Huh? Do you have your entrance fee? Entrance fee? For what? Uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, we have five francs today, comrade. But, uh, the uh, remaining 15 will be with you shortly. I suppose that will do. So, comrade... I hear you are a keen follower of the English political scene. Mm. Yeah, I am, yes. The, the Labour Party's in a terrible state. I can't see Ramsay Mack holding for much longer. <laughs> I see you have a thorough knowledge of conditions in England. <laughs> Could you write a series for our Moscow Weekly? Our rate is 150 francs per article. Yeah! <laughs> uh, me sorry. Certainly, oh, okay. certainly. Oh. I, I, I'd be honest. Oh, then you will hear from us by first post tomorrow. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Uh, or perhaps the second. Yeah. And remember to bring a parcel of washing with you next time. Ah, oh, at last, our fortune really is made. Oh, did you hear it call you? Comrade, not <laughs> 150 francs, Eric. I feel a celebratory cigar coming on. Eh? <laughs> Next morning, I rush down to the bistro to greet the first and the second post. Nothing. Three days pass in this fashion. Perhaps the secret society has found somebody else to write their articles. After ten days, I decide to pay the Russians a visit. Naturally, I'm careful to bring a parcel that looks like washing. The editor has vanished. Who he was, or what he did, nobody knew. He had nothing to do with the Communist Party, that was for sure. I think he was simply a swindler who preyed on Russian refugees and naive English writers. <sighs> you know, I have to admit he was clever. 
The office had looked exactly like a secret communist office, and as for the parcel of washing, <laughs> that was a stroke of genius. We only pay him five francs instead of twenty. That is some consolation. And we're back where we started. <laughs> what are we going to do now? Well, I have two pieces of news, Eric. Mm. I am pursuing a vacancy at the five-star hotel near the Place de la Concorde. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah, you bastards! How dare you, sir? You assaulted the captain of the Russian army and the British nobleman. <laughs> now, where was I? Oh, yes, my other news. You recall my Russian friend in the Ruta Commerce? The man who keeps promising to open a restaurant but never does. Mm, the very one. Well, he has asked me to come here this morning to discuss my prospects. Tell me, do you think I look hungry? You look pale, Boris. Mm, no good, no good. It's fatal to look hungry. Makes people want to kick you. Wait, 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 wait. Ow! What are you doing? I'm trying to bring some colour to these pale cheeks. Ah, is good? Mm. Ah, good. Now let us hurry in before the flush has faded. The patron is a short, fat man in a double-breasted suit. He looks like an incompetent cheat. But Boris is not discouraged. Monsieur le patron assures me that I will be maître d'hôtel when the restaurant opens. And you, monsieur Eric, will be the principal plonger. Mm -hmm. Plonger. Our dishwasher. If trade is good, you have every chance of rising to lavatory attendant. Mm -hmm. How exciting. And when will the restaurant open? The auberge will open exactly a fortnight from today. In time for lunch! Oh, <laughs> Marvellous! We are a wonderful life. It can change in a moment, Eric. Boris. A moment. Oh, only two weeks to hold out. Mm. Eh? Look, Boris. I think that I will soon have mistress again. Oh, Boris. Ooh, that... Will she be dark or fair? I wonder. Boris, that restaurant is a disaster. The dining room is grotesque. The kitchen is no bigger than a bathroom. And to cap it all, I saw two bailiffs hanging about at the back door. I thought they were customers. Boris. Oh, rats! Two bad days follow. We sit on a park bench in the Jardin des Plantes, watching office girls walk by in their spring dresses. As Boris and I watch longingly, Beef. we create our favourite menus. It's cute plums. We have only 60 centimes left. Half a dozen. No. A dozen oysters, burst, new potatoes, suet pudding, roquefort cheese, a liter of burgundy, and some old brandy. <laughs> we are too hungry to think of anything but food. I am too lazy to do anything but sleep. But then... Eric, Eric, what? I have found a job at that hotel by the Place de la Concorde. What? I stole a few scraps for you. Oh. Here, look, minced veal, a wedge of camembert, some bread, mm. oh, and uh, an eclair. Mm. Mm. <laughs> this is delicious. Mm. Stolen food. Always tastes good, don't you think? <laughs> There's more where this came from. Mm. One of the plongeurs left today. I put in a word for you. Yes? And you start tomorrow! <laughs> <laughs> the next morning, I arrive at what I will call the Hotel X at a quarter to seven. A stream of men are hurrying in. The assistant manager greets me. He is an Italian with a round, pale face, haggard from overwork. Have you washed the dishes before? Of course. Uh, you're lying. I cannot tell from your hands. Still, all our guests are American. We need someone to practice our English on. You come downstairs. 
we enter a narrow passage deep underground. The stifling heat and cramped space remind me of the lower decks of an ocean liner. What's that humming noise? It's a kitchen furnaces. Uh, you'll get used to it. We pass doorways which sometimes let out a shouting of oaths, sometimes the red glare of a fire, and once a shuddering draught from an ice chamber. <laughs> What was that? The porters are taking ice blocks to the kitchen. Each one weighs a hundred pounds or so. You keep pulling away, huh? Here is your station. You serve our meals to the senior kitchen and staff, and then a wash up afterwards. And I shave off that silly moustache. Only the cooks are allowed to have silly moustaches. You understand? My new home is a cellar below a cellar. The temperature is 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Washing up is odious, boring and silly, and yet it's easy work. Apart, that is, from when I go to the kitchen. The kitchen of the Hotel X is like nothing I had ever seen or imagined. It is a stifling, low-ceilinged inferno. Twelve cooks skip to and fro, their faces dripping with sweat. Scullions, naked to the waist, stoke fires and scour huge copper saucepans. There are three counters for dispatching food. Everyone seems to be in a hurry and a rage, including the head cook. Two scrambled eggs, one shallow brio with sauteed potatoes. Hey, hey! Which lunatic asylum did you come from? I'm from England, actually. Well, you English son of a bitch! Make sure you put a place on the correct counter. Okay. Thanks. I'm called Macro, Pimp, or Ponce. 39 times that day. I finally finish work at a quarter past nine. The assistant manager pays me 25 francs for 14 and a half hours work. I fully expect to be given the sack, but the assistant manager has other ideas. The head cook says he enjoys calling an Englishman of foul names. Can you sign on for a month? Uh, yes, thank you. I work six days a week at the Hotel X. It's grueling work. I prepare meals with Boris and a wonderful Italian waiter called Valenti. Our first burst of work comes at eight when the 102 guests begin to demand breakfast. The service lifts land with a simultaneous crash. You're buttering toast when down comes an order for tea, rolls and three kinds of jam. At the same time, down comes another, demanding scrambled eggs, coffee and grapefruit. It, it's like sorting a pack of cards against the clock. But Valenti always pulls us through. It takes a year to make a reliable kitchen hand, you know? Uh, pass that toss, will you? A year? Dead before that. I must have walked 15 miles today and this heat is just it's making me sick. Uh, here, suck on some ice. Oh. We're almost done. Lunch is another period of pandemonium. And then at 6.30, the grand turmoil of the day begins. The dinner hour. I, I wish I could be Zola for a little while, just to describe the situation. 102 people demanding individually different meals of five or six courses with 50 or 60 people to cook, serve and then clean up the mess. It, the whole staff is tired out. Many of them are drunk. At 8.30, the work stops abruptly. We lie on the floor, resting our legs. How do you cope, Valenti? Huh? <laughs> it's a den of maniacs. I've been doing this for 14 years. I'm like a piston rod. In this job, you have to be hard, you have to be tough. <laughs> You're a kitchen slave, not a soldier. Oh, so what? I'm proud of what I do, aren't you? All I've learnt here is the true value of sleep. Well, that's something. <laughs> Come on, let's set up for tomorrow. Uh... Once a week, Valenti and I exchanged the kitchen for the relative calm of the fourth floor pantry. Valenti is good company. He knows the Hotel X's deepest secrets. Everyone is on the take, huh? The cellar man steals brandy, the waiters sell broken bread, and the cooks snatch whatever they can get their hands on, huh? Look, help me out with this, will you? Okay. Valenti is a typical waiter. He is a snob in a black tailcoat and white tie. Monsieur, your condolences, Duvaux. 
<laughs> With a bow and a smile, he sucks up to the rich customers and laughs at their jokes. He takes pains to serve with style because he feels he is participating in the meal himself. Never feel sorry for a waiter. They find the servile nature of their work rather congenial. <laughs> What's in this sink? Wait, that's my dishwater. So I need to wash my face. <laughs> <laughs> What's so funny? Well, I was just thinking about how there's only a double door between that spotless dining room and this disgusting filth. Uh, that lot will never not do. Valenti, look around you. There are cockroaches in the bread bin and dirt all over the walls. We clean where it matters. Yeah, that's my point. We scrub the dining tables and polish the brasswork because that's our job. But back here, it, it's revolting. Aren't you ashamed? My main job is to be on time. And I save time, like everyone else does around here, by being dirty. But, Valenti, can't you see how crazy this is? Everyone's too busy getting food ready to remember it has to be eaten. That's how it goes. Let's say I drop a piece of toast. Now, I know that it must look right and be ready immediately. So, I pick it up, wipe off the sawdust, and sweat, and carry on. And you think I'm the only one? Watch the head cook inspecting a, a steak. He, he prods it with his fat pink fingers. Every one of which he's licked a hundred times that morning, then licks the gravy. Once the cook has wiped his fingerprints off the plate, the waiter dips in his nasty greasy all fingers. All right, all right, I've heard enough, thank you. You know, the more one pays for food in Paris, the more sweat and spittle you're obliged to eat with it. Huh? Here, keep this roast chicken in polish, will you? It fell down the lift shaft. The Hotel X is one of the most expensive hotels in Paris. Most of the guests are American or millionaires. As a result, they are remarkably easy to swindle. The ordinary charge for a night's lodging, not including breakfast, is 200 francs. If the customer has a title or is reputed to be a millionaire, all his charges go up automatically. One chicken a la king for table four. Our guests also know nothing about good food. One customer from Pittsburgh dines every night on great nuts, scrambled eggs and cocoa. Another asks for a breakfast of salt and hot water. Valenti charges him the usual 25 francs. The customer pays without a murmur. Perhaps it hardly matters if such people are swindled or not. Hotel life, mon ami. Well, it's better than I thought. After paying rent and tobacco, I have four francs a day left over for drinks. Four yeah. francs? Oh, that's true, well. That's <laughs> <laughs> oh, You know, I could get used to this. I'm like a contented beast. I work and I sleep. I have no time to think. Paris has shrunk to the hotel, the metro, this bistro, and my bed. Ah, your bed. But oh. don't get too comfortable. I saw the patron of the auberge today, and he swears they will open in two weeks' time. Huh. Can you imagine? At last, I will be maitre d', and we will have more women <laughs> than we can possibly handle. <laughs> yes, but didn't he say that two weeks ago, Boris? Yes. Uh, Citizen! Remember. <laughs> Fury, she's starting up. Who on earth is that? Citizens of the Republic! That's a strange creature. He works steadily all week as a stonemason, and then on Saturdays he drinks himself stupid. Doesn't he? He doesn't look real good. Are there any what? Frenchmen here this evening? I rise to remind them of the glorious days of the war when one remembers the heroes and the <laughs> you are dead! 
everyone's laughing at him. Yeah, that's because Furex is a communist when he's sober and a violent patriot when he's drunk. <laughs> he makes the same speech every Saturday night, no? He does. <laughs> come on, Furex, speak up, come on. The heroes who are this? Yes. The heroes. Oh, oh my God. God. Oh. This was how Boris and I passed our Saturday evenings. While the wine was flowing, we felt like a notable set of people, but by half past one, we were merely a crew of underpaid workmen grown squalidly and dismally drunk. One night, there was a murder beneath my window. A man lay dead on the cobbles, his skull cracked with a piece of lead piping. I was in bed and asleep within three minutes of the attack, as were most of the people in my street. Well, we're working people. Why waste sleep over a murder? Eric! Ah, Eric! Mm. Eric! Mm. Eric, come on, wake up! Mm. Wake up, my friend! You can give notice at the hotel. The auberge opens tomorrow. Tomorrow? Yeah, of course. We shall need a day or two to finalise a few little things, but we are on our way. Come on, come on. Are you sure about this? I don't want to give up my job for nothing. No, absolutely. Don't go back to sleep. Come on, hand in your notice and meet me in an hour, yes? Come on. <laughs> Voilà, l'auberge de Jean Cotard. Boris, you said a few little things needed doing. There's no water or electricity here. There's no kitchen stoves. Mm, well, this is true. There is some work to do, yes, but with our help. The Petro will achieve his dreams. So your friend is employing us as workmen, not waiters. Which means he won't pay us or feed us until the restaurant opens. It's just... <coughs> I've given up a good job for nothing. Ten days pass. Attack! Attack! Yeah. Attack! As Boris and I wait for the restaurant to open, we clean out the cellars, fix the shelves and stain the floor. But the water and electricity remain off because the patron cannot pay his bills. We loaf about the empty restaurant, too hungry even to get on with the work that remains. Only Boris now believes that the restaurant will open. He thinks the patron's money is tied up in shares and that he is waiting for a favourable moment for selling. On the tenth day, I tell the Patron that I can no longer continue working without an advance on my wages. The Patron promises the advance and then, as usual, vanishes. I am absolutely at the end of my money. My rent is several days overdue. And worst of all, I'm back on a diet of dry bread. I do not feel equal to a scene with my landlady, so I pass the nights on a street bench. As I lie there, amid the rubbish and the rats, I have plenty of time to think. I was a fool to deliver myself into the hands of those Russians. But it's too late now. And then... <laughs> finally, we open for business. Eric, 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 we made it! Amazing what the lick of paint will do, eh? Boris, there are two large rats sitting on our kitchen table. Oh? Do they have reservations? Very funny. Oh, come on, Larry. Come on, mon ami. Look out there. Every table is occupied. 
We even have some French people here. Our kitchen is a pigsty. The floor is an inch deep in stale food. I'm scraping grease off plates with bits of newspaper. Ah, mere details, my friend. I don't hear you complaining about the 500 francs a week and free food. Yes, for a 17-hour day and no day off. Would you rather be back on that park bench? At least it was clean and quiet, which is more than I can say for this godforsaken place. Life soon settles into a routine that makes the Hotel X seem like a holiday. Every day at six, I drive myself out of bed and fight for a place on the metro. By seven, I am in the cold, filthy kitchen. A pile of greasy plates awaits my attention. Potato skins, bones and fish tails from the previous night litter the floor. At 11, the first customers start to arrive. Suddenly, everything becomes hurry and bad temper. It, it's not the same furious rushing and yelling as at the Hotel X, but an atmosphere of muddle, petty spite and exasperation. No, the other one. Look out, that stick's burning. Our lady cook, a Baltic Russian, five feet tall and a yard across the hips, keeps up a ceaseless, nagging chorus of orders. Many times I told you not to bleed the beetroots. Oh, put the knives away. What have you done with my trainer? This goes on until three, except when the cook has an attack of nerves. <laughs> Between three and five, I work frantically to get all the plates cleaned before dinner. By now, the cook and I are feeling unsteady on our feet, having not eaten or sat down since seven. We drink pints of tea to keep going. At half past five, the hurry and quarrelling begin again. It's worse than before because everyone is tired out. I never thought my life would come to this. I studied music in Vienna. I was first bassoonist. Oh, in, shush, woman! In wood. All right. Who has stolen my tips? Huh? By this point, I am neurasthenic with fatigue. The quarrels become continuous. Give me that saucepan, idiot. Get it yourself, cow. Yeah, move it. Be move it yourself, cow. At 11, we stop to eat. At midnight, thankfully, the cook leaves. These hours will be death of me. Tomorrow I quit. Leaving me to finish the washing up. Sometimes I miss the last metro and have to sleep on the restaurant floor. It hardly matters. By this time, I could sleep on cobblestones. This wretched life goes on for over a month until I can stand it no more. I have to escape. Hey. Hey. Eric? When I have a quarter of an hour free, I write to my friend Brenda in London. What's this? Not more artistic nonsense, I hope. Oh, oh, sorry, please, that's a private letter. My dear Brenda, I need to ask you a small favour. Could you please help me to find a job of some sort in England? Anything so long as it allows more than five hours sleep. You're not leaving us, are you? Uh, not, um, yet. Does I feed you? I find your work, and this is how you thank me? Oh, Boris. See the treachery? You, you, you're the most ungrateful, Eric. You, 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 you're inconsiderate. You, 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 you're selfish and you, you're shallow-minded. You, you're incompetent, Eric. You're short-sighted. Damn you! I'm sorry about that, listeners. While I wait for a reply from my friend, I want to leave you with a few thoughts on the life of a dishwasher. A dishwasher is a slave, and a wasted slave at that. Why are so many people tied to such useless drudgery? I believe it is from fear of the mob. The mob, so the middle and upper classes say, are such low animals that they would be dangerous if they had leisure. 
it is safer to keep them too busy to think. <laughs> this is a superstitious fear. It's based on the idea that there is some mysterious, fundamental difference between rich and poor, as, as though they were two different races. In reality, there is no such difference. The average millionaire is only the average dishwasher dressed in a new suit. The next time you treat yourself to a fine meal or a weekend away, remember that. What is the point of big hotels and smart restaurants? They're supposed to provide luxury, but in reality, they provide only a cheap, shoddy imitation of it. A, a smart hotel is where a hundred people toil like devils in order that two hundred may pay through the nose for things they do not want or need. Hmm. Until next week, goodbye. In Down and Out in Paris and London by George Orwell, adapted for radio by P.G. Morgan, George Orwell was played by Samuel Barnett. Boris was played by Stephen Greif. Madame Falaise by Claire Vowsden. The Russian Cook by Rachel Bavage. And The Pawn Shop Owner by John Dougal. Other parts were played by Anthony Glennon, Jasmine Callan and Sam Dale. The producer was Stephen Canning.